In our last lecture, we learned that we could not only work with rectangular shaped velocity versus time regions, but also ones where the velocity curve had a slope, where it was angled. And so, for example, to find the distance traveled from this curve, we would take one half the base times the height. Uh, in this case, the base is a distance of one, where the units are hours, and the height has a distance of 40, where the units are miles per hour, and we'd come out with 40 times a half, or 20 miles. That was the distance traveled. Now, that was useful, but in fact, we can go farther than that. Namely, we can show by the same sort of uh, rudimentary proof that complex regions combining rectangles and triangles, we can also find the area under the curve in order to compute the distance traveled. So for example, what did we just find here? We found out that this region right here um, was 40. What about this next region? Well, we'll segment it first into a rectangle. How big is the rectangle? Well, it's two hours wide and 40 miles tall, so I'll just add that. The next region would be 2 times 40. That's 80 miles. And then what about this next region? Well, we can break it up into a combination of triangle and rectangle. Let's deal with the rectangle first. That's an hour by 40. So that's going to be 40. Just correspondingly put it over here. So we'll write to 1. That's the width and the height is 40. So what's that? 40 miles. Okay, and then we have this last triangular area. Now, that's one-half base. Base, again, is one hour. And the height, the height, again, is just the portion from here to here. So that's 20 miles per hour. I know it's odd talking about heights as being in units of miles per hour, but we've gone over that ground before. And so that area is 10 miles. Okay, so let's put it all together. How far have I gone? I went 20, 80, that's 100, 40, 50, 150 miles. So is it safe to say then that the, at the end of four hours that I'm at the position of 150 miles? Well, no, it's not. Because, as I hope all of you remember, we have to still add in the initial position. Okay, now I know I sort of sucker punched you on that, but it's only because so many students forget that the initial position needs to be added in. And I'm sure you personally would never do it, but your friends will, so you've got to be on the lookout for that. So let's say the initial position was 30 miles. And so finally, we would say after four hours, the position at time t equals 4, that's what I mean by that, would be 150 plus 30 would be 180 miles. Before we dispense with this curve on the left, there's something else I want to show you. It's not strictly calculus, but it's about uh, a simpler way to calculate area under some curves. And that's this. We, we noticed that this triangle stacked on top of the rectangle in totality, it has an area of 40 plus 10, or 50 uh, miles, this structure here. Now notice, this structure is also what's called a trapezoid. What's a trapezoid? A trapezoid is something that has, that's a four-sided figure with two sides parallel. And there's a simple way to calculate the area of an entire trapezoid all at once which can often save us time. 
it's important enough that I want to cover this trapezoid rule. So the trapezoid rule for area is the average of the two parallel sides. I'm going to write that out. times the distance between them. Let's just say what that means. As I say, let's just do an example. So what is the average of the two parallel sides? Well, these are obviously the parallel sides. And the height of the one is 40, and the height of the other is 60. 1 half 40 plus 60 times the distance between them. What's the distance between the two parallel sides? It's one hour. 40 plus 60 is 100. Take half of that, you get 50 times 1, 50 miles. It's the same calculation that we got by doing the triangle and the rectangle separately, but this can be a real time saver, and we're going to be doing a lot of these, so you ought to learn that trapezoid rule. Let's just try one more example here. What I've added in to this situation is that of uh, one involving negative velocity. So I just want to make sure that we're comfortable going back and forth working with these diagrams. Okay, what do we have here? Well, we could break this down into a rectangle followed by a triangle, but what do we have? We have a trapezoid. Now, does the fact that it's tilted over on its side matter? No. Remember, the definition is, if you've got a four-sided figure, and we certainly do in this case, and you have two parallel sides, these are our parallel sides, you can take the average of the two sides and multiply by the distance between them. So let's just do that. Uh, we've got one half. Uh, the one side is an hour long, the other side is two hours long and the distance between them is 20 miles per hour. So we've got uh, 1 plus 2, that's 3 halves times 20 is uh, 60 halves or 30 miles. And what about this next area? Okay, so now we have a triangle but we've got negative velocity. Let's just think this through. We've got one-half base times height is the area of a triangle, one-half. Now, what's the base? Well, we're going to make the base one hour. What's the height? Here's where we get the negative. The height is negative 20 miles per hour. And so, all told, it's negative 10 miles. The person went backwards 10 miles. And what have we got here? Well, this is a little different in the sense that we've got a triangle and another triangle, but the width is half an hour. Okay, so let's do that. One half. What's the base? It's 0.5. What's the height? We're doing this triangle here. So it's still got that height of negative 20. And that's going to give us uh, negative 10, half of that is negative 5. And what have we got finally in this last half hour? This is our triangle. Again, 1 half base times, the base is 0.5, 1 half base times height. Uh, again, that was a negative. And what's the height now? The height is positive 20. So that's going to give me positive 5 miles. You can see how these last two triangles cancel each other out, this one and this one. And so what's the net? Uh, the net of it is we've gone uh, 30 minus 10 is 20. That would be down to 15, but then back up to 20. 20 miles. And I hope everybody is asking at this point, please tell us the initial position. Oh, very good of you. The initial position, it turns out, was 35 miles. And so the position at t equals 4, which we're going to write as x of 4, 
is the initial position, the 35, plus the extra 20 miles we've gone, or in other words, 55 miles. There we go. Our focus throughout this lecture has been on triangular shaped regions of velocity versus time curves. And the fact that the velocity, which initially just was represented with flat horizontal lines, could be represented with sloped angular lines. Well, where did those sloped lines initially appear? If you'll recall, we first had sloped lines back in distance versus time curves. Of course, in a distance versus time curve like this, this sloped line represented uh, a forward progress in position. Okay. So this meant that we were moving forward. Okay. This, of course, means that we were at rest. We were stopped at Wendy's or whatever. And then this means we're moving backward. Okay. We're heading back towards home. It was a negative change in position. And so we then created these velocity graph, velocity versus time graphs from the distance versus time graphs. And velocity, let's think about what it means more formally. Velocity is, it's the rate of change of position with respect to, that's just an abbreviation I use, with respect to time. Velocity is the rate of change of position with respect to time. So it raises the question, what does sloped velocity versus time curves mean? Well, this is not about going forward. This is about increasing our velocity. This is not about being at rest. This is about being at a constant velocity. And this, of course, is about decreasing velocity. This doesn't mean that we're moving backwards necessarily. It just means that we're not going as fast forward as we were before. Our velocity is decreasing. So given all of that analogy, the question is, is there something that is the rate of change of velocity versus time in direct analogy to how velocity itself was the rate of change of position with respect to time. Is there a corresponding quantity that measures how velocity is changing? And the answer as you can guess, is yes, there is. It's called acceleration. And we can graph acceleration versus time curves just by plotting the slopes of the velocity versus time curves. So to sum up, we learned that we can draw increasingly accurate or realistic velocity versus time curves because we found that we could combine triangles with rectangles in arbitrary combinations and still compute the signed area under the velocity versus time curve. Then we learned some mechanics, just a shortcut rule for calculating the areas of trapezoids, and we found that that worked in either horizontal or vertical orientation. And finally, we concluded with the fact that sloped velocity versus time curves, that the slope corresponded to a new quantity acceleration, which is the rate of change of the velocity itself with respect to time.